Well, hello from Oxford. Thank you to have so many of you all over the world here today for this webinar. I'm Tindara Lore, and I'm Business Development Manager for Executive Education here at Save Business School. And I have the pleasure to introduce this webinar today. Today's webinar is about valuation for mature companies. Um, Professor Ludovic Falipo will take you through a presentation and some interesting myth-busting theories on this topic. Ludovic Falipo is Professor of Financial Economics here at Said Business School, University of Oxford. He specializes in private markets investment and is the author of several papers, as well as the bestseller Private Equity Laid Bear um, book and post podcast. He teaches on the MBA and the Exact MBA programs here at Oxford, and is also program director of the Oxford Program on Valuation of Private Assets, which is an on-campus program taking place in November, and also program director of our Oxford Online Private Markets Investment Program, which runs several times throughout the year. So just a few housekeeping points before we start. All participants will be muted for this webinar. So if you have any questions, please write them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And we will try and answer some selected uh, questions at the end of the session. And also this webinar will be recorded and shared in a few weeks time with you. So now without further ado, it is my pleasure to hand over to Ludovic for the start of the webinar. Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, to this webinar. I'm going to talk to you about valuation, um, but I warn you, this is going to be uh, relatively fundamental. Uh, we're not going to go into uh, much detail, so advanced topics. The idea is to give you uh, a taste a session of what um, something that would be at the very beginning of, of our course on valuation would look like. Um, but uh, we are certainly not going to go to uh, very difficult questions on valuation. We are going to stick to what uh, usually the textbooks tell you, why I would tweak it a little bit, and we take it uh, from there. All right, and slightly provocatively, I proposed to uh, teach the formulas, which is a bit unusual for uh, a teacher. Uh, as usually we are promoting uh, the use of formulas. All right. That said, I usually uh, start with, with an example here. Um, I'm not going to go over the Excel spreadsheet for this, but it is uh, on my website, uh, plaidbear.com, if you're interested. But this is usually how I start my course on valuation. We take a company that uh, will be liquidated in 20 years for 10 million. So the slight uh, cheating part there is, is, is that we, we know uh, this information and usually it, it wouldn't be the case, but we know how much we are going to get in 20 years from this company. And we also know how much we're getting every year. So basically to keep things simple, if I buy this company every year, this company will give me a million uh, every year. And after 20 years, I get 10 million. The question is, is that the correct price of this company? Is 10 million the right price? Now, many of you uh, would be able intuitively here to say, well, this is very unlikely to be the right price because um, if I pay 10 million, I get a million every year, and then I get 10 million, it feels like pretty high return for, on this investment, and 10 is unlikely to be right. Of course, however, it depends on the level of interest rates. Imagine, for example, that a government gives me 10% yield in the same country and, and uh, it's a safe government. This investment may just be, you know, um, I would be indifferent between doing this investment and investing in a government bond, right? So imagine government bonds give me 10% yield. If I give 10 million to, uh, to a government, uh, I will receive 1 million a year and then 10 million after 20 years. So um, if a government a bond or a, a risk-free account gives me 10%, this investment is actually not particularly good. If uh, the, the borrowing rate, however, or, or the alternative is much uh, lower, uh, then this investment will be better. So here in this exercise, we propose that uh, there is a bank uh, that can give you an interest-only loan for 3.17% a year, uh, whatever is your down payment. And the question is, is this 
it is possible that this investment is worth 10 million. So of course, just from what I just said, if if if, if what you get at the bank or at the government is 3.17 percent, it's much less than this 10 percent yield that you have quickly calculated by looking at this cash flow profile. And so you will say it's worth more, but then the question is how much more, right? And some of you who have been to uh, who have taken finance courses, you, the first thing we teach in finance would be like an NPV formula, and, and you can see here all the ingredients, and you will calculate this NPV formula. The problem, however, is that, you know, is this a formula? Is this formula right or not? And a lot of people learn the formula without really understanding the intuition, and that is a problem because you don't know when it is useful and not useful to uh, apply this formula. So in general, uh, and this is the success spreadsheet that I point people to, I build a, a, a simple financial model, which will be used uh, later on as well, for people to get a sense of what would be the right price of a company and to demonstrate what would be the right price of a company. Now, if you simply play with different entry price and you borrow, let's say, the entire amount that you need to buy this company, because why wouldn't you borrow the entire amount? It doesn't matter what the down payment is. So you pay, you, you borrow the entire buying price and you pay 3.17% a year. And you could look at which price you think is a good deal or not. The problem is that as you will start getting this price higher and higher, imagine that you pay 20 million for this company, you will see a profile of cash flow that is like negative at the beginning and then positive at the end. And then how do you prove to someone that this is a good deal or this is still, or it has become a bad deal because it's too expensive. So what we do is that we build this financial model with a full cash sweep. So any excess money at the end of the year uh, gets used to repay the principal of the loan. And you build this financial model, again, it will be useful for later anyway to start playing with Excel and, and building financial models in Excel. And if you do that, and you, in this case, you because you have this full cash sweep, you will have zero cash flows in the, bid, in the middle, and you will have only one final cash flow, which makes it easy then to see whether it's a good deal or a bad deal. If you put the price at 18 million, for example, here, uh, it will still show up as a good deal because you will have borrowed 80 million, 18 million. Um, you will have zero cash flows all the way to the end. And at the end, you get some money, which is the definition of a free lunch. You will not have had paid for anything because you borrowed the 18 million you needed at the beginning. You have zero cash flows throughout. And at the end, you receive a, a lunch, you receive money. And so that's a free lunch. And that's not possible. People will be fighting and bidding up to get uh, uh, that company. And if you continue moving up the price of a company at 20, you will get zero free lunch. There will be nothing left at the end to be exactly zero. And if you go to 22 million or 21 million, you will lose money, which tells you this is too expensive. So 20 million is then the fair value. It's a value that, that where people are indifferent between buying it or not, because at this borrowing rate, um, they could have put 20 million in the bank and match the cash flows. And it turns out that the NPV formula that you learned at school uh, is exactly giving you 20 million as an answer. So the NPV formula is a very powerful and meaningful formula because it tells you what is the price at which there wouldn't be a free lunch, which is usually what we think is like, you know, the, the indifference point or like the fair value for the price of a company is when there is no free lunch. If there is a free lunch, it's too cheap. And if a free lunch is negative, then it's too expensive. So the, the NPV formula makes a lot of sense. On exercises like this, we, we do see that. We can see that it, it had spit out the, the number that in Excel, by playing around with the model, I would have reached out as well, uh, more intuitively. But the problem, as we're going to discuss, is that the formula is correct, but the input in practice are unknown, and this input are uh, very challenging to come up with, which makes the use of an NPV formula for valuation purposes uh, extremely problematic. And in practice, and what I will argue here, is that we will not quite use the NPV formula. We're going to do something that uses the, uh, the good aspects of it, but we'll leave out uh, the dodgy aspects of it.
So this is just a summary of, of, of what would happen here. The price will be 20 million because uh, otherwise there will be a free range. This is what the NP formula looks like. If you've been taken any finance course, this is what you've been taught. And indeed, this formula would have given you the right answer on this occasion. So to summarize, what is it that you, people then uh, tell you to do in, in, in the textbooks is that you think of the future cash flows of a company. Usually you do not go uh, beyond your five. Um, you stop at your five. We don't exactly know why five, but it's usually where people stop. There, there, is, there would be some theoretical reasons for like choosing the horizon, but usually people just choose five. Um, so you write the, the, the um, free cash flows, or it could be beta, but usually the people are more advised to use free cash flows. You, 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 you write these future uh, uh, cash flows. And then uh, after year five, uh, you would apply this perpetuity formula usually to say, well, from year five to forever, uh, if it grows at a fixed rate, uh, then I have a formula that would tell me what's the present value of that. I put this as a final value. And then you have this step in between that is extremely challenging and people get a lot of uh, traumatic experience on this in calculating a work. What is the cost of capital for like a leverage buyout for a growth company for, and, and, and people, you know, if you give this exercise to 200 students, you will get 200 different answers. Uh, and even if you do it with professionals, you would get fairly different answers. And people agonize on this. I'm thinking, you know, but if it's more levered, the work should go up. But what if the leverage is structured differently? Should the work still go up? Like what if, you know, there is a lot of debt on the company, but most of this debt is senior. Does that change something uh, compared to evolve that is junior and, and, and not collateralized? Uh, does it change something if it's a pick note instead of like a senior debt? It should, but... My formula from the textbook would tell me the, the work is the same because it takes into account only the total leverage ratio. Is a shareholder loan debt? And I put it in the debt ratio or I don't. So you would have these zillions of questions uh, that will make applying your uh, textbook formulas nearly impossible when it comes to work. Um, it's already very hard in normal companies that, that the normal textbooks will cover. When it comes to like a leverage buyout with a complex capital structure, using formulas to find a work is completely suicidal. It's totally nonsense, uh, again, because just the, the complexity of a capital structure is such that your work formula is off. That's it. It's like so wrong. Like there's no point in even trying to use it. There are more problems with this NPV approach, which is that not only you don't know the work, and it could have been anything, but you don't even know your growth rate, especially the growth rate from your six to forever. And the valuation of a company is going to be extremely sensitive to how much growth you assume from your six to forever. Um, so in this table here, it shows a classic uh, setup where you have assumed the 5% growth uh, for the first five years, for your six forever, you have assumed 1% and you came up with a work at 8.5%. This company, imagine this is all in millions. This company has currently a cash flow of 100 uh, million uh, and it is valued at 1.5, 1.6 billion. If I would change the, the assumption on uh, the growth rate forever from your six to forever, and I put it at 0% and I put my discount rate at 9%, which is hardly different from 8.5, then I would say that this company is not worth 1.6 billion, but it's actually worth less than 1 billion. And if I put the, the growth rate from your six to forever at 5% and the discount rate at 8%, which would be you know, probably equally defensible, uh, then it's 3 trillion, 3 billion. So it's like twice as expensive. Um, so that makes the value of, of, of a company is extremely uh, uh, sensitive, extremely sensitive to assumptions that you do not have any idea about. So you could pick any number um, because you have no clue which one to pick. And each one of them will give you a massively different answer. And so that also makes the use of this formula and this approach very, very unsatisfying. You, couldn't, you cannot do that in practice. You couldn't come to someone and say, well, you know, I could have assumed this and your company would be worth three, 3 billion, or I could have assumed something else, which is equally defendable, and then it would be 1 billion or less. Um, you cannot do that, okay? 
But this would be, you know, this is a standard textbook thing. And again, you answer 200 students, uh, you ask them evaluation questions, you'll get 200 different answers that are all extremely precise. So when, because people are using these formulas, often without thinking much about it, they end up with answers that are like, you know, 1.596 billion dot, and then it, it goes on and on and on to like the cent, and sometimes beyond the cent. So it's an extremely precise number, but it's precisely wrong. It gives you a full sense of precision because the formula gives you a very exact answer, but you, 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 you've put random input in there. So, you know, you could have got any num precise number out. And so you have these kind of cartoons that illustrates very well the point saying, I didn't have an accurate number, so I just made one up. And people say, you know, studies show that, you know, accurate numbers are just equally useful. And people say, how many studies show that? 87, okay. So uh, that's to remember that, you know, you might as well uh, pick up random numbers uh, if you're going to do uh, this kind of uh, things. So usually you are told that there is another uh, approach to valuation that is not NPV and that's what practitioners use more and it is uh, comparables. So what you do is that, so in this very example, I have a private company. I know uh, the uh, earnings of this private company. So um, usually in a, in a leverage buyout context, we work with EBITDA or EBITDA minus CAPEX or EBIT. Uh, all three of them are kind of equally good. Some people even use like um, only the, the um, so a subset of a capex, but um, so you have these three measures of earnings of this private company, and then you find two publicly traded companies that look like it, uh, and then you calculate the ratios for all of them. So what is the enterprise value to EBITDA for each one of them? Notice here as well a big difference in in in, in private equity, which is actually quite important, which is that we work for with enterprise values, and therefore with a measure of earnings that is something like EBITDA or EBIT. The you have in the public equity space, you have people working with net earnings per share to calculate the market cap of a company. Uh, this is highly problematic because it is sensitive to the capital structure of a company, and you you can make very big valuation mistakes by uh, looking only at earnings per share and and deducting market cap. Here you have you work at the enterprise value, so the anti cake doesn't matter how it's divided between debt and equity. And then therefore you have a measure of earnings that needs to have to be measured before you have paid the debt holder or the equity holder. The debt holder receives the interest payments. This is the I in EBITDA and EBIT. And, um, and it is before any dividend to the equity holder. And so EBIT or EBITDA are good measures when you're looking at enterprise value. So, you have publicly traded companies here in this example, you calculate these ratios. Then usually people try to find recent transactions in the same industry, like this is what's written there as recent M&A and some recent LBOs. And then they usually just take a bunch of average. In fact, the way they do it usually is with, with these fa famous or infamous football fields where for the publicly traded companies, a recent M&A and LBO, they, they put a range of, of, of uh, um, valuation ratios in a sort of like football pitch and then they put a line somewhere and say, okay, here is the value of a company. Um, this is very dissatisfying as well because um, just taking a bunch of averages like this is basically averaging things that are different for a reason. Um, the only case where you can use an average uh, in life is when you, you are trying to appeal to what's called the central limit theorem which is that if I have, if I'm trying to find out where people were trying to shoot, let's say, you know, it's a shooting uh, competition and I, and I don't know where the target was and I try to find out where the target was. If I take the average of all the people shoots, I would probably get very close to where the target was. It's because if people randomly try to hit something, some people will hit on the left, on the right, some people up, a, a bit to down, etc. And so in the middle of all the points, I will have my, right uh, target. When it comes to looking at the valuation of public companies or recent M&A and recent LBOs, these were not people shooting in the dark and then the average of this will give you a right answer. 
is that each of these companies have a different valuation for a reason. There is a reason why public company A is more expensive than company B. It could be that uh, uh, it is because company B is too big and in this industry, bigger companies come at a discount compared to smaller companies. It could be that company B is growing faster, uh, company A is growing faster than company B, uh, et cetera. And so the company that you are looking at needs to match the characteristics that are driving the valuation of the companies in that industry. And that is something that is sometimes a bit overlooked. And that makes this method of just using comparables very silly. So again, the textbook um, approach for NPV gets to a fairly nonsensical number. If you use also a textbook approach to comparable, which consists in find comparable companies and recent transactions, calculate a bunch of ratios and take averages, this is also going to be equally nonsense. But for both the NPV and the comparable, there is something to say for the approach. And so that's why we're going to see what is, uh, what, uh, what is proposed here, which is close to what is done in practice, which is uh, combining the best of the approaches and avoiding their uh, drawback, hopefully. So to try to uh, um, illustrate a bit more uh, this issue with comparables, so these are real data uh, around the LVO of Hilton. I wrote a case study on Hilton. You can uh, get it for free. I have teaching notes if you're interested in your teacher. Uh, it's all on my website, plaidbear.com. So if you take the Hilton LBO, um, so in 2006, if you would have looked at just simply calculating the CAGR EBITDA, so the growth rate in EBITDA over the past five years, it would have been the same number for Marriott and Hilton. The EBITDA was slightly higher for Hilton. The EBITDA, however, were actually pretty similar. And if you calculated the ratios for Marriott, I would have got to 16 times for EBITDA, 19 times for EBIT. And Marriott was valued at 21 billion. So here you are like in a sort of ideal scenario uh, because Hilton and Marriott are like very, very, very similar. So often people, when they say, you know, I cannot use comparables because I don't know what to compare it to, or I don't know which comparable to select. Here is a situation where like, it's very easy. Like if you're valuing Hilton, Marriott is a very, very clear comparable. And to a point where even the EBIT is nearly the same. So, and the growth rate is the same. However, even in this very simple scenario where you want to use comparables, um, you find two different prices uh, for Hilton. You would find a price based on EBITDA, which is 27 billion, and a price based on EBIT, which is 23 billion. And it's a big difference. And so the question is, even if I'm using comparables here, what, what do I do? So you could say, you know, like the textbooks of most people, well, just take an average is 25 billion. But there, just like I said earlier, with like the silliness of averaging, there is a reason why Hilton and Marriott are valued quite similarly on an EBITDA basis uh, and not on an EBIT basis. Um, so I didn't show you here the price of EBIT of Hilton, but uh, maybe it's on my next slide. Um, that's the offer of Blackstone. So it's still not there. The, the price of, of Hilton was actually uh, 20 billion. So the market was putting Hilton, Marriott, Hilton at 20 billion. So very much like Marriott. And so clearly the market was valuing Hilton and Marriott on a basis on EBITDA and not on a basis on the basis of EBIT and not of EBITDA, right? So the stock market before the offer by Blackstone was putting Marriott and Hilton at the same value meaning that since they have the same EBIT, this is what the market was using, the EBITDA was much higher for Hilton. And Hilton was always saying, oh, but on an EBITDA basis, we are undervalued by the market. This is so unfair and blah, blah, blah. And you see that Blackstone offer is basically on an EBITDA basis. It, it, it is like the market was valuing Hilton on an EBIT basis. Blackstone comes in and says, I will pay you a multiple as a function of EBITDA. But again, there, there must be a reason. Uh, and uh, of course, I don't know the, the, the inside stories or, or all the details, but in a nutshell, when an EBITDA and an EBIT deviate so much, right? You can see that the EBITDA and the EBIT of Marriott are quite similar. The, so Marriott has a similar EBITDA as EBIT, and the EBIT of Marriott and Hilton are the same. Hilton has a much higher EBITDA. 
what it is smelling of usually is that Hilton has a lot more assets than Marriott. And that's why the depreciation amortization and also therefore the CapEx will be very different for uh, uh, Hilton and Marriott. And it is indeed the case. If you look at uh, uh, these two companies in 2006, Marriott was mainly a franchise model. And so if you just, if you were purely franchise model, even your EBITDA and EBITDA would be nearly the same. And Hilton owned their own hotel, so they own a lot of hotels. And therefore, if you have a lot of real assets, you're going to have a lot of DNA. And so clearly, because the, the stock market was putting Hilton at the same valuation of Marriott, the stock market was discounting heavily the fact that Hilton had real assets, which could be that, you know, they said you have a lower valuation because you're less risky, um, because you have all, all these real assets, you can spin it in different ways. But the, 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 the base was that, and so the market was not being stupid, um, the market said, you know, you, Hilton has all these real assets, that's the difference with Marriott. And therefore, on an EBITDA basis, these two companies are not comparable, but on an EBIT basis, Marriott and Hilton are then comparable. And that's why I valued Hilton on an EBIT basis. That was what the stock market was saying in 2006. It makes complete sense, and it illustrates the fact, again, that you don't just take comparables and take averages all over the place. You, you decide on like which one you're going to choose, and, and even within the comparable, like Marriott, which ratio you're going to choose and why. So the stock market was rightly choosing EBIT uh, as a basis to value uh, Hilton and compared it to the EBIT of Marriott. Why is it that Blackstone paid so much more? It's because Blackstone had as a plan to transform Hilton into Marriott. And, Hilt and Blackstone thought that they could get uh, 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 Hilton EBIT to 1.7 because they would sell all these real assets. And therefore, they could pay uh, 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 this extra amount, and there, thereafter, they would be uh, valuing uh, Hilton on an EBIT basis. And this is exactly what happened. Uh, Blackstone uh, had as a plan to sell re re real assets. They didn't sell it, sell as many maybe as, as they were hoping because 2007, 2008 happened. But in any case, even if you look at uh, the financials we have from pre-IPOs, we see that Blackstone had removed a lot of real estate uh, had developed a franchise model extremely aggressively, and so therefore had become a lot more like Marriott. And so when they did their IPO in 2013, then Hilton and Marriott were uh, similarly priced also on an EBITDA basis. So this is to illustrate again the importance of not blindly just taking comparables and averaging and taking even within comparables or kinds of ratios and averaging. This is like a very, very poor approach to uh, valuation. So like I said, we've seen two approaches. Uh, each of them has some value, but neither of them uh, will do the job by itself. And so we are going to find a hybrid way to uh, approach valuation. So the first thing, and you cannot escape it, is that you have to look at past information to get some ideas about what uh, to use in your assumptions for uh, building a model, which is the approach that we're going to favor here to come up with evaluation. People often use past growth in EBITDA in their model. Uh, I wouldn't, and especially here, this past growth is really silly. Uh, if you're quite used to, uh, to this kind of setup, you, you may spot it right away. You see that 2006 has a huge jump. You again, if you're used to these things, you would uh, anticipate that it's probably because there was a big acquisition by, by Hilton, and that's correct. There was a merger of Hilton US with Hilton International, so it's a major merger. Hilton was split into two US and non US, and they could get go, go together and merge. So, of course, the EBITDA jumped, but that's totally you know mechanical. This is what we call inorganic growth, and so when you are trying to find out the growth of a company. Uh, you would need to, you cannot just look at the numbers like these numbers are coming from Capital IQ uh, because these are going to be inorganic numbers and they're absolutely useless. And it's quite amazing how often people are taking these inorganic numbers and then just apply them uh, uh, in projections. This is a really, really bad idea. Um, for projections of EBITDA, you should really uh, 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 look at your business model, work out all the details to get an idea about what is the EBITDA over the next three years to five years. The next three years should really be feasible. Uh, five years is a bit more changing, but you should be there if your business plan is clearly worked out 
you should be able to uh, get your projection of EBITDA. And then there are a number of things there uh, that are important. Usually DNA is, is quite fixed as a fraction of EBITDA uh, and it's pretty close to uh, uh, the CapEx rate. Uh, the taxes are also usually roughly uh, uh, fixed and the change in networking capital is usually close to zero. And you can see here that the, the, actually the, the, the CapEx is, as, as a fraction of EBITDA is very close to DNA. So I'm highlighting this because I'm going to propose to you a way to write a model in just five lines. And that will be, there will be a few assumptions behind it, but I'm gonna argue that I'm not losing too much with these assumptions in most cases. And therefore, if you have ever seen a financial model in practice, it's often 10 Excel spreadsheets with lots of lines. It's very hard to, to, to digest, very hard to read. Um, and here, what I will show you is, is, is a version that just has five lines but there are some underlying assumptions. And the advantage of these five lines is that we're gonna be able to work on our intuition and to debate on the core drivers of evaluation rather than being you know, stuck with like 10 lines that are about like the change in networking capital. So this is what it looks like in five lines. The first line, which is very important in the leverage buyout context, and, and more and more even for non-leveraged buyout for publicly traded companies, there is quite a lot of debt in these companies nowadays. And so uh, keeping track of the level of debt would be important. So we start, this is the actual uh, LBO of Hilton by, by Blackstone. And the amount of debt in 2006 at $21 billion is actually the amount that Blackstone put on, 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 on Hilton. The projection of EBITDA that goes from 1,600, so 1.6 billion, to 2.6 billion, which is a fairly aggressive growth, it, it turns out to be 11% per year. Uh, but this was a projection of the management, so this was worked out out of a business plan, like we proposed. And then the way to get uh, this model very simple is that you, you go from EBITDA to EBIT. Uh, for that, you take out the DNA. So we saw that in the past, it was 33% of EBITDA. So I take out 33% each year. Uh, the, however, here, uh, I will leave it like this, but when Blackstone, uh, the, uh, like I just said, Blackstone plan was to slash uh, uh, CapEx and, 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 and therefore DNA. And so uh, in the real model of, of, of this LBO, you wouldn't use the 33% because that came from the old way, the old strategy. In the new strategy, the DNA would be more like uh, five to ten percent, very much like like Marriott. And so the DNA fraction you would use here is more like the one of Marriott than the one of of Hilton in the past, right? So um, this is also where you you need to use a bit of judgment and logic uh, rather than being mechanical about things. So you take out DNA, you get to EBIT, you know the interest payments on that. Uh, this one is very simple. Uh, you have a, 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 a total. Um, cost of debt, which is known. Uh, so Blackstone had got 7.8% uh, interest on the debt. Uh, it's 21 billion of debt. You can calculate how much interest payment there will be. You get to EBT, you take out the taxes, which are again fixed. So here there is just like one extra simplification, which is that whether the EBT is positive or negative, uh, uh, I, I calculate the tax the same way. So I'm basically here implicitly assuming that I'm getting a tax credit as cash right away is not quite the case in practice. So you could change the formula here to make it more realistic, but you get the tax credit only uh, uh, as you, you, you get back into uh, positive territory for EBT. But you can, this is not gonna change much the results. Then you get to net earnings. And the reason why you get to net earnings, which is now a, a cash flow variable, is because I have assumed that DNA was close to uh, CapEx rate, which is again, usually pretty similar. And so then this net earnings is really the net cash I have at the end of the year. And what I do is that I do a full cash sweep, which is again, fairly standard in private equity. And here, because I have a negative uh, number at the end of the year, my debt uh, amount increases slightly. And then that's it, I, I, I drag this over five uh, years and my model is done. I've just had to write three, four lines and, 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 and I'm there. Now, once the model is written, I need an input, which is the exit value. And there, um, I'm not gonna use the perpetuity formula because this is where the NP formula is most wild. And I don't want to use a WAC anyway because I don't know what the WAC is. And I don't want to uh, use a growth rate forever because I don't know what it will be. 
So I'm going to use a comparable. But there, if I, you, you need to be careful because we said that this comparable was for the company at exit. So I need to think about what would Hilton be in five years time from now. And so here, according to what we said earlier, it will be more like Marriott. And therefore, what will be the exit value of, 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 of Hilton in, in five years time? Well, I've, if it became like Marriott, then I should be able to exit it at 16 times EBITDA. Uh, and the EBITDA has been projected there. And so this would be what I anticipate is the exit value. I need to repay the, the debt, but I kept track of the debt so I know how much it is. Therefore, I have the equity value. And then all I'm going to calculate is that how much equity did I have to put in this deal compared to what I get at the end? That gives me a multiple of money and gives me an annualized rate of return. And so here I can see it's 28%. And so then now the only question I have to ask myself is, can I live with this or not, right? So rather than trying to calculate a whack, I get to a number here for how much am I gonna make if I'm paying this much money for this deal and can I live with it? Is 28% a good number? So this is gross of fees. So the fees in private equity are in the range on, 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 on such a thing about nearly 8%, but uh, let's say it's eight uh, for simplific simplification. So you are 20% after fees. And then you have to think whether, uh, you know, this is a good case scenario, right? You have your EBITDA that went up and so on. You need to think about what are the, the odds of this good case scenario. So if you think that in three cases out of four, let's say, uh, this is gonna work out, then your 20% return is really 12%, right? If you think that otherwise you get zero or something like that. Then you could say, okay, if, if I get 0% with one chance in four, and this has three chance in four to work, then my 20% in the good case scenario, 0% in the in, in, in the bad case scenario, uh, then I, I expect a return of 12% net of years. Can I live with it? And the answer would be, well, just about. It would be just about because um, this is, um, uh, the return of public equity. So that, that's what I promised my investors to, to beat that number. So, so that I cannot really go below this expected rate of return. And therefore I cannot high, go higher than the price uh, that is being proposed here by Blackstone, which was 5.7 billion plus 21 billion of debt. So you see the, 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 the way to think, right? So the, if you look at the distribution of leverage buyouts, 20% of them uh, end up with a multiple of less than 0.5. Uh, about a quarter plus of the LBOs end up with like just returning your money. And so usually then when you have your good case scenario, you say, well, you know, I should think that this will happen in three cases out of four. One case out of four, I just get my money back. And so, Therefore, this is my expected return on equity. Can I live with it, yes or no? And if the answer is yes, then it means you can afford to pay a bit more for this transaction uh, if you have to, uh, if you're pushed by uh, competing offers, or you, 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 if, it, if the return is not satisfactory, given what you promised to investors, then you need to scale it down and offer less money. So basically, uh, this is uh, the proposed uh, 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 approach, and this is very much how people also do it in practice, that they will build a model. From the model, they infer how much return they expect on equity. They have an assessment of what it would be in a bad case scenario and in a good case scenario, what kind of like probability there is for each, and then whether this is in line with what they promise their investors, and what they promise their investors is a certain degree of risk uh, with a certain return. And therefore, this is how they work out from what they promise their investors in terms of risk and return uh, uh, point, what is the price we need to pay for this company? What is the maximum price they can afford for the company? And in that situation, they didn't have to bother with a WAC. They didn't have to bother with uh, 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 um, growth assumptions for, for, for infinity uh, and, and, and so on. But nonetheless, of course, the work is at the background because the, 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 you, you have to think of the cost of capital, whether it's satisfactory or not. But you don't use all these obscure formulas and make assumptions that you know the capital, the, the total amount of debt includes or excludes shareholder loan or peak notes and all these things. You don't need to bother with that. You, you should look at the deal, how it's structured. It gives you a sense of how risky it is. 
And given the, given the amount of risk in this deal, you have a sense of how much return equity you should get for such a deal. And that will dictate how much do you pay for this transaction. So that's uh, basically it. Uh, I'm going to read some of the questions that are, are arrived and while uh, Tindara tells you a bit more about the program uh, that we are uh, teaching and offering here. Thank you so much, Dodo, for sharing your valuable knowledge on this much debated topic. And um, so, yes, yeah, so just before we finish, before a couple of questions, um, um, just wanted to remind you this webinar is in support of our executive education programs. Um, we have two programs of which Professor Ludovic Falipo is program director. We have an on-campus program, which is the Evaluation of Private Assets program. This is a five-day program on campus taking place on 27th of November to the 1st of December. And we have three places remaining for this program. So this program, as per the name, is all about valuation, uh, valuation methodologies across different asset classes. So we look at real estate, infrastructure, startups, mature companies. And we also discuss key valuation topics like valuation mistakes, how to strike a deal at the right price, variation due diligence and disputes, ESG. And we have throughout the whole week, live case studies and group work. Um, so because of this group work, the opportunity for networking is really amazing. Um, you have the opportunity to liaise um, network with Oxford faculty, industry speakers that we bring into the classroom, uh, as well as you know the amazing participants that join the program who are all professionals with many years experience and we have people coming from all over the world for november we have about people from 20 different countries and from different sectors as well from the offices investment banks corporates entrepreneurs we have pension funds insurance companies so a great way to really see different perspectives and on the next slide um, we have the online program could, could we just go to the next slide just to put it on the screen if that possible? Thank you. So for those looking for a broader private assets program, we have the online private markets investment program, which you can attend obviously from where you wherever you are in the world. Um, it's six weeks. We start the next one on the 27th of September. And this program will give you a comprehensive understanding of private markets, private equity, asset allocation, and that fluency in the language and terminology of private markets will keep, keep you with the skills to compile and implement a private market investment strategy, as well as gain knowledge on how to determine value, how to enhance the value of private assets. And Throughout the, the course, you gain insights into mega trends, future, future predictions of private markets landscape, and also the role of ESG. If you would like any more info, here you have my email address, tindara.lore at sbs.ox.ac.uk, or email the exec ed at sbs.ox.ac.uk. So thank you for listening. I'll just pass over to Ludo. Uh, Ludovic for uh, any questions that he may want to answer. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, the main question, the bigger question is is, is from uh, Benjamin Forestier and, and Polytechnique, which, which uh, uh, coincidentally, uh, I'm delivering this web webinar from uh, just a few kilometers <laughs> from Polytechnique. Um, but um, right, so you are right. In a nutshell, um, what you are writing is is, is very uh, co co consistent with what I just described. You would pick a target return uh, for uh, a transaction, and then uh, you uh, and you say, "Well, you use the comps to see you're not too far off at, at entry." I assume you mean. Notice that in my modeling here and the approach, you need to do a very thorough comparable analysis, not to cross check you in the ballpark of right but to get to your uh, exit multiple, you need it. If you use the NPV formula for exit, and unless this is really an infrastructure or core real, real estate assets, um, you, it, it's going to be very tricky. You will have to, again, think about the work and, and, and growth rate forever is going to be difficult. So you'd always need a very thorough um, comparable analysis for the exit. 
So this is where it is very linked again to your business plan. You are you have a company right now. What are you going to make of it in five years? So for example, imagine. So there was a famous transaction that was very controversial in Germany, where uh, Blackstone took over a German, the number one chemical company in Germany, and the the the, the goal of Blackstone was to make it. Uh, uh, American-based. So they, they, they filed all the headquarters in Germany. That's why it was quite controversial. And then they make it American uh, and list it in the US. And the reason they did that is because in, in Germany, the, the, the multiples were, were much lower for chemical companies than they were in the US. And the company hardly changed between the, two, the delisting and the relisting. But it made a big difference uh, in terms of valuation. So here, when you do your comparable analysis, it's a very good example where you see that doing like what is the, the current comparables in Germany for chemical companies, it is what you say. It's a, it, 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 you can double check with, with your answers uh, whether it makes sense or not. But that's not what you are going to be using the comparable for. You are going to say, what is it I'm making this company in five years time or in three years time? And the answer is I'm making it an American-based chemical company. And therefore, I need to do a thorough comparable analysis to know what is the price of chemical companies in the US of that size with that kind of growth prospects. And I need that because that's going to be my exit multiple and my exit value. When Blackstone takes uh, uh, Hilton, they want to make it like Marriott. So you need to have a comparable uh, uh, analysis that is quite deep to understand, OK, if they make it like Marriott, how is Marriott valued? And I'm going to use these, these metrics to apply it to Blackstone. If somebody is doing a buy and build of bakeries in France, then I'm not going to look at entry multiples of bakeries in France. I'm going to try to see what kind of size do I think they're going to reach in five years time and what kind of uh, multiple there are for uh, uh, bakeries in France, chains of that size uh, that are doing this kind of work. So, so the comparable analysis is really key, but for the exit. And most people think of it as an entry thing and, and, and that's not, it's, it's, it's key for the exit. Uh, and it changes your approach and how you, you, you think about it. The, uh, then uh, uh, whether this approach of like model with a target return and seeing what is your maximum price given your target return, I've seen it everywhere in the world. I don't think it's particularly French. It's, it's, it's certainly the case in the UK and the US. So it's, 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 it's totally global. Your next big question was, but then how do I choose my target return, right? So then this is where I, I know that there are sometimes flying on the internet, like if this is this industry, this is the cost of capital and that industry is this cost of capital. And if it's this size, then this is the cost of capital, et cetera. It, it's, not, it's not that like, like, like this, it cannot be that mechanical. You don't have like a recipe book with like telling you what is the cost of capital for different type of companies. What you need to do is, you have talked to your investors, you have told them about your strategy, they kind of sense a certain amount of risk for this kind of strategy, and then you have kind of a greed of a return that you're targeting for them. And you have a sense of what is the likelihood that the good case scenario happens and what happens in the bad case scenario. So to be concrete is this. Imagine that I'm saying I'm, I'm raising a fund in France that is going to do buy and build of bakeries in France. And so it's going to be a growth strategy I'm not going to use much leverage. I'm not planning to use much leverage because on an active buy and build like this is going to be hard and then there is not much you know, lending in France. So I'm planning to use moderate leverage, um, only senior, uh, and, um, and, and, and it's a buy and build of, of bakeries. I've already identified the targets. So I already have them in the pipeline. This is the size I should reach. And if I look at all the chains of bakeries like this, this is the price. And in other countries, I may develop that strategy as well. It should work out. So I'm quite confident that you know there's not much leverage, it's fairly low risk. I don't have much of a downside scenario. It, the upside is, is 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 okay. If we think about it today, the interest rate is at like say five percent for a risk-free investment. This is not a totally risk-free investment. Um, should the premium be? like 3%, 4%, 5% of that investment. Well, there is some execution risk in that strategy. Um, there are still some downside scenarios, et cetera. I would say that probably is reasonable to target 10% minimum return equity today, if it was a buy and build of bakeries in France and or Western Europe and, and, and without much leverage, that, that would be what would look like a reasonable number. 
And then you have to, then that's it, you have your number. It's, it's about 10%, it feels right. Five would not feel right. Eight would feel deep punchy. 12, 14 would feel overly generous if, it, if, it, if the strategy is as low risk as I'm describing. So, you know, we end the ballpark of 10. Okay, so I can give you an exact number, but then we end the ballpark of that. And then we have to think also of the probability of this to fail and, and so on to get to the number that I need to target in a good case scenario. So this is how we work out that number. Rather than like working out a formula or downloading from the internet, which industry, which size at what return, like that, that it's very sensitive also to like the risk, the, the risk free rate to, to all kinds of like the current business environment. So where, for example, I'd be confident on, on, on the buy and build of bakeries in France right now, I wouldn't be as confident on the buy and build of some more cyclical sector maybe in France right now. For example, if somebody would do a daycare buy and build strategy in France, Given the political environment at the moment in France on private uh, uh, daycare, I would think that there is quite a high execution risk here, and I wouldn't ask for ten percent. Then I would probably be at twelve or thirteen. But that's that's how you know you do it. it, it this number is, is necessarily going to be a bit rough, but it's it's your 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 willingness to pay is not going to be massively different if I use a twelve versus a thirteen, and 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 so I have my number. But for sure, it's 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 not it's, it's not uh, uh, you know it's not a really clear receipt. Um, browsing for the questions, a couple of them is asking about uh, the spreadsheets of the the, the, the case studies and, and so on. I cannot type in the in in the chat, but it's on my website plaidbear.com. I I don't think I can type, or maybe I can. Let me try. Uh, no, a panelist. No, I can uh, type only to the host or a panelist. So maybe Tom can type it. I'm putting it here uh, and you can uh, forward it, but otherwise you can just Google it. But plaidbear.com uh, is where uh, all this information is. So there is, there is a page where there's like all the Excel spreadsheets for my textbook and valuation is chapter two. So chapter two would have these spreadsheets. Uh, and the case studies, there is a page that has like all my case studies, including a movie case study I made on valuation, actually. Uh, it's there. Um, so you can read all of that and you can watch also this movie that is not completely finished, but the existing version is there. Um, I'm reading a bit more. Um, yeah, so then there are questions about impact and, 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 and things like that. Um, so I can tie it to what I said earlier. If I'm thinking that there is a greenium, if I'm thinking that, look, I'm, I, let's imagine that I'm, I have this buy and build of bakeries uh, plan in France, but I'm gonna do only organic uh, bread and, 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 and bakery products. And, and then I'm going to, I have a new innovative system for, for making it low carbon footprint because of, of the way I'm gonna change the supply chain or the distribution chain. So, so then I can say, well, you know, some people probably would then accept uh, a lower return because of these nice features that I'm going to put in place. And therefore I can target instead of, of a 10, 11%, maybe just a 9% will be enough given the greenium that, that I should expect on, on, on this company. And therefore uh, I'm willing to pay a bit more for, 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 for these assets because I'm, I'm, I'm going to get the, this greenium. Right, I, I I don't need to offer this extra money, but but my willingness to pay would increase because I have this green strategy. So the way you bring in uh, uh, considerations of impact and the like is that either your investors are valuing impact, in which case you have a lower return that you need to target. If there is a nice impact uh, that you that, that that you're obtaining, and the advantage of this approach is that it's right in your face. You have you 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 would have targeted returns at eleven or twelve percent, but you're an impact fund. And if a project has a particularly large impact, then it's not 11, 12, but you talk to your investors and you think that at nine, they will be comfortable given the nice impact. And so it's at nine. And so your willingness to pay increases and the numbers increase uh, 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 correspondingly. I'm an economist. I don't believe in stories of like win-win. If there is like a positive impact, then you get even higher returns. And so like, like otherwise like all the logic like falls through, right? Like, and, and it makes no sense. I, I believe in trade-offs. So uh, if, if something, has a nice impact and, and would increase your return, then you just do it no matter what. So, so, so that would be part of a normal projection of cash flows. 
But if you if, if you have in mind that you have a green amount there, so that some people are willing to accept lower return because you're doing something nice socially, then it totally falls into this model. It becomes very natural to integrate it in this model. So the question about the, the, the growth uh, 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 assumptions, yeah. So you, you can look at the past growth or things like that, uh, but usually uh, um, you, you, you try to build it from your business model. You try to work out how many shops are you going to open? How many you're going to close? Uh, what is your savings on CapEx? What, what is it going to be the evolution of revenues? Uh, under a normal scenario, what's going to happen over the next five years? Especially in an LBO contest, context, People usually have a 100-day plan written extremely clearly, and 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 they need to work it out very precisely, and that leads very naturally then to a projection of 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 EBITDA and other metrics that are very natural. Um, so somebody's asking about startups. Uh, that's why I was very careful to put on my slides of mature companies. I'm not talking about startups. You cannot do this for startups because you have no projection of EBITDA. There is no EBITDA. So with startups, it's 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 a lot more flair. <laughs> it's more it's more vague. Okay. The more you're you're sure of your cash flows, the more you're gonna rely on 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 the model. So if you're doing core real estate, core infrastructure. A very simple strategy like the one I just described on, on buy and build of bakeries. You, you, this model is you can have quite some confidence in it. If we're talking about the startup, like you come up with whatever price, like like it, there's no thing that will really give you some very clear guidelines. Yeah, I mean, you, you you do need to have a sense of how much money at one point you will be making with that company, but if it's a really early stage, you you don't even know that. So um, when it's an early stage, it's more about. Um, what is the story here? Is there really a market? What are the odds that this is going to succeed? And as a function of the odds of this succeeding at all, then I'm, I'm going to give you a price range. Like it, it's more that, right? Like if I think that you have very low chance of succeeding, I just give you zero and the valuation is zero. If I think you have a slight chance of maybe succeeding, then maybe we can like see how much money you need and then we'll, we'll you know, we, we finance you at cost kind of thing. So uh, there was another question to the startups. You, you know, you can't on, on, on startups. You need to have cash flows. Um, so the question on, 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 on Blackstone. Uh, yeah, Blackstone paid a massive premium for Hilton. And it was because they had in mind that they were going to sell the real estate and, and, and transform it into a Marriott. And so, so uh, funny enough, they got sued for having paid too little they lost the lawsuit, uh, but they didn't have to pay too much for it because they could still say, look, like it was a massive extra what we paid. The people suing were saying, well, you know, uh, even though you paid a lot more, uh, you are Blackstone and you're going to do uh, amazing things with it. So you should have paid yet more. Uh, valuation differences between US and European oil companies. Uh, I don't know about valuations of oil companies in particular, but we can see wide discrepancies between US and Europe. So like the example I was giving earlier about this chemical company that was taken out of Germany to be made American, the Delta was massive. Like Blackstone did a killing on this by just moving the headquarter effectively. So it, it's, um, it, it, it can be very large sometimes. And I wouldn't be surprised. And it can depend on sort of like linking it up to all the ESG questions. Uh, it, could, it could very well be like if you list an oil company in a country that does not uh, care too much about ESG, it would be a different valuation than if you try to list an oil company, let's say, in, uh, in the Netherlands or something. Uh, So somebody says uh, that valuation is an art. I don't like this expression. Uh, I like to think that one can approach this logically. And that's what I, I, I've tried to, to, to show you here. I don't think uh, it's it's an artistic uh, uh, thing. And and uh, Grace is asking, you know, what if there are no comparables? Uh, yeah. Um, often they're, they're not really a company that is exactly comparable. In fact, it's by definition, if somebody is exactly like you, then you probably don't have a business. So there will never be an exact comparable. What you need to think about always is, let's look at other companies that are a bit in my situation, even if they're not in the same sector, and let's see how much people are paying for these companies, right? So maybe I have something very innovative in the healthcare industry with a certain degree of risk that it would work if you know there is not another pandemic or something like that, or it will work if there is another pandemic. 
then you can look at other industries and think like, okay, what other industries will have a different outcome if there is another pandemic or not? And 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 who has like a bit of a, a profile like mine? How much are we paying for these kind of companies? So the problem of, of people saying I don't have a comparable is often because they're looking for same size, same industry and same country. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be. You, you, it, what you are after is a company that has a similar risk profile. So a company that is in a similar situation, even if it's not in the same sector. And if you think about it this way, you will broaden your set of comparables and, 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 and you'll be able to, to, to learn about what is being valued by the market and, you, and, and, and to get to, 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 to a, a multiple ratio for, for your company. It's non-trivial, but that's, that's the spirit. Uh, the cash sweep, you can uh, you can find it in my textbook or, or, or online. Cash sweep means you take all the money at the end of the year on a company and you use that to repay the debt. And if, and if you don't have enough money, you just increase the debt. All right. Uh, I think I'm over time. Uh, there were 200 people on this call, so that was cool. Uh, I guess it shows that uh, there was some interest. Um, you know how to find me on LinkedIn. I guess most of you found found, found the webinar via LinkedIn. Um, be in touch and and uh, yeah, thank you for all your questions and interest. Thank you. Bye bye.